In this segment, we're going to take a look at America's role in the war between 1941 and 1945. Some questions that we want to answer. What was the overall strategy of America and its allies in World War II? How did America's strategy during World War II reflect available resources and the geographical scope of the conflict? And why were some of the battles in World War II considered turning points during that war? Let's take a look at some of our World War II leaders. The big three, as you see above me, include, from left to right, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. That's Franklin Roosevelt from the United States. Yay! And Winston Churchill from Great Britain. Yay! But the bad guys, oops, over there, include, on the left, Benito Mussolini, fascist dictator of Italy, and Adolf Hitler, Nazi fascist leader and dictator of Germany. We need to understand that the wartime strategies reflect the political and military goals of the alliances. It includes the resources that they had on hand and, again, the geographical extent of this conflict. When we take a look at the Allied strategy across Europe, American forces were joined by Great Britain and the Soviet Union after it was invaded by Germany. They adopted a policy of defeat Hitler first. Even though it was Japan that attacked us, we knew that the first emergency needed to be dealt with, and that was Adolf Hitler. So most of American military resources were initially targeted for Europe, and then later we would move those. When it came to the Axis strategy in Europe, Germany had hoped to defeat the Soviet Union very quickly to gain access to its oil fields in which to then utilize as part of its war machine and blitzkrieg the rest of Europe. They wanted to force Britain out of the war through a long bombing campaign and a campaign of submarine warfare to isolate Britain as an island and essentially put it under siege. And they wanted to do this before America could get involved and turn our industrial and military strength on them and turn the tide as we did in World War I. As we take a look at some of the major battles and turning points of this war, there were a lot of battles that, and we could go on for an entire semester talking about them all. But we want to focus on three major turning points here in Europe. The first one happened, well, in Africa at the Battle of El Alamein. German forces were threatening to seize the Suez Canal in Egypt, and they were held off by the British. This defeat prevented Hitler from gaining access to the oil fields in the Middle East, and it also prevents him from attacking Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union from the south. With the defeat at this point, the British pushed west across Africa. Meanwhile, Americans joined in the fight and joined up with the British and attacked Italy here from the south. Another major turning point, this time on the Eastern Front, happened at a place called Stalingrad. Yes, the city that was named after the communist dictator of the Soviet Union, Stalingrad, lasted several months. It was a months-long siege. Hundreds of thousands of German soldiers were killed or captured in this long siege of the Russian city in which Joseph Stalin gave the order, we don't surrender here. This is our last stand. And they were willing to fight to the very last man. Unfortunately for the Nazis, this battle raged on and on and on. They ran quickly out of ammunition, they ran out of supplies, they were ill-equipped to handle the brutally cold Russian winter, and they were forced into submission. At that point of time, the Red Army of Joseph Stalin began to rapidly push back against Germany. 
The turning point for America came at D-Day, or Normandy, France, when British and American forces launched an all-out invasion to liberate France from Nazi control. Remember, France had surrendered after just a few weeks of fighting against the Nazis, and we needed a beachhead. We needed a secure location with which we could launch a counteroffensive against Germany. Now, Joseph Stalin had been bearing the brunt of this war for, many, for the first several years of World War II. And now, with us attacking on Hitler's Western Front, his forces needed to be divided, and they were already pretty ripped up at the exploits of the Red, of the Red Army. And as we invaded here, gained a foothold at the cost of thousands of American lives, and much, much hardship, American, British, and now the French forces, who were left over, joined in, pushed back against Germany. And that's going to lead to German defeat. Victory in Europe, or VE Day, came on May 8th, 1945. Hitler had committed suicide and left Germany essentially alone without leadership. And those who, who were left in relative charge of a, of a destroyed army, army agreed they simply needed to surrender. But the war's not over. Still, on May 8, 1945, America has a very powerful enemy in Japan. And so now it's time for us to focus our entire attention on defeating the Empire of Japan. When it came to the Allied strategy in Asia, in the Pacific, the American military strategy called for an island hopping campaign. That is, seizing islands closer and closer to Japan and using them as bases for air attacks on Japan and cutting off Japanese supplies through submarine warfare against Japanese shipping. The Axis strategy in Asia was after Pearl Harbor. Again, a lot of this hinged on their success in Pearl Harbor. Japan wanted to invade the Philippines, which they did, and won. Indonesia, and then they planned to invade both Australia and Hawaii. The leaders in Japan hoped that America would then accept Japanese predominance in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And rather than conduct a bloody and costly war to reverse Japanese gains, we would simply go, ah, you win, you've got this territory. Japan did not want to attack the American mainland, but they did want a dominant empire in Asia and the Pacific Ocean. When it comes to the major battles and turning points in the Pacific Ocean, things were much different here than they were in Europe. The major turning point, or I should say the first turning point, happened at the Battle of Midway. In the miracle of Midway, American naval forces defeated a much larger Japanese force as it prepared to seize Midway Island. Coming only a few months after Pearl Harbor, uh, this was America's first major victory. What this does is this stops Japanese aggression. This is as far as the Japanese got. Uh, it was almost a surprise victory, thus we call it the miracle of Midway. And this begins our active carrying out strategy. This starts our island hopping. As American forces move further west across the Pacific, retake places like Guam and the Philippines and get closer and closer to Japan. But we're not close enough. Two very important battles happened at Iwo Jima right here, shortly followed by Okinawa right here. These two battles cost America thousands and thousands of lives, but it brought us closer and closer to Japan. 
the Japanese fought more and more ferociously the closer that we got to, to the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa because they knew that from these two islands, America could launch direct air attacks on the mainland and potentially, potentially launch a land invasion. The Japanese soldiers, as I said, fought fiercely and over every single square inch. They were deeply entrenched, which is why we have so many American casualties during this time and why these battles lasted for months rather than simply days. Uh, Japanese soldiers and civilians would rather commit suicide than surrender. And so the fighting was extremely ferocious. But once we won Iwo Jima and Okinawa, we were now close enough to launch air attacks and we had a secret weapon. Boom. The Pacific battles came to an end when the United States decided to use the atomic bomb. Facing the prospect of horrendous casualties among Americans as well as the Japanese if the American forces invaded Japan itself, President Harry Truman made a very important decision. He ordered the use of atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He felt that only this massive show of force would give the Japanese leadership reason to surrender. These guys were willing to fight to their very deaths and to the deaths of all of their citizens. If we could show enough force that we could quickly end the war with these atomic bombs, perhaps, perhaps we could save more lives. However, we need to note that tens of thousands of people were killed in both of these cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And while they were both military targets, many civilians were incinerated with these devices. But it was this show of force that finally brought Japan to the table where they accepted surrender and offered that to the United States. Now the war is going to be over. So why did Truman drop the bomb? Obviously we know that this is gonna shorten the war. This is gonna save American lives, even save Japanese lives in the case of, a, of an invasion. While tens of thousands of people have died during this bombing, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, could have died during a land invasion. But Truman also had other reasons. He also wanted to show off a little bit. He needed to show off his power to the Soviet Union. Even though they were our ally against Hitler and Mussolini, the Soviet Union had not declared war yet against Japan. They had planned to do this six months after Hitler's surrender. If we can drop the bomb on Japan first, force them to surrender without the Soviet Union's help, we could prove to them that we don't need them in the future, that we have the strength and we have the power. And we also come to realize that the Soviet Union is likely to be our next arch enemy. And besides, the Manhattan Project, which secretly built this bomb, cost gazillions of dollars. I don't know the exact number. And what good is having a weapon that you're gonna spend billions on if you don't use it?